This video lecture is entitled Pursuing Justice. And this video lecture is for the course Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision Making at the East Asia School of Theology. Social justice has become a popular catchphrase in today's world. People are interested in seeing society become more fair and more just. But what is justice and how should it be administered and by whom? These are some of the naughty and yet very important questions we are going to address in this video lecture. There are two basic types of justice. There is retributive justice and there is distributive justice. The first kind of justice we're going to talk about is retributive justice. This justice is what might be called a more reactive kind of justice and is concerned about the proper ways in which to mete out punishments that are fit for crime committed. To apply this idea, many cultures would say that stealing is wrong, but the actual way to punish a thief will often vary significantly. In some Muslim societies, for example, the thief is required to forfeit the hand that stole the object, whereas in some societies, thievery is not punished nearly as harshly. At one point in medieval Europe, thievery was punishable by death. So the actual way in which just punishments are secured is a matter of significant and ongoing cultural, religious, and social debate. The second type of justice is distributive justice. This justice is more proactive in that it is concerned with the positive question of how justice should be administered as a general rule and not in response to some wrongdoing. As controversial and difficult as retributive justice issues can be, distributive justice has a far broader range of concerns, applications, distributors, and recipients. Thus, distributive justice is by far the more controversial and less clear cut of the two types of justice. By the same token though, it is also extremely important. Our concern for this video lecture will be focused on this latter notion of justice, that is distributive justice. But first, let us attempt to define justice and understand justice in the light of both love and freedom. <clears throat> Justice in relation to love and freedom. First, let's talk about love and justice. While distinguishable, love and justice are not the same thing, but neither are they wholly separate or unrelated. Justice tends to be more impersonal, institutional, and indifferent in the sense that it is blind. Love, on the other hand, is more personally directed and concerns itself with actively rectifying the wrongs it encounters. Biblically speaking, they are seen as complementary and not necessarily in tension or competition. Together, love keeps justice from being harsh and justice keeps love from being sentimental. 
So they need each other, even though they are clearly not identical to each other. Let's talk about freedom and justice. Although sometimes seen as virtually synonymous in some societies, it seems quite clear that true justice always tends to place limits upon and parameters around freedom in a sinful world where people use their freedom to oppress and control and destroy one another. And yet, freedom remains part of seeing justice done, for no society can be just without some significant base of freedoms. However, unbridled freedoms that show no concern for the presence and limiting aspect of the way they impact and influence, for better and for worse, others inevitably becomes unjust and sinful, leading to chaos and social harm. In this sense, there is more apparent tension between freedom and justice in any functional society. So let's try to define justice. The first kind of justice is meritorious justice. This is giving a person their proper due for some action, effort, or impact. And we can see this in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Typically, this form is not used in every area of life, but only in those areas where it seems the most appropriate, like in economics and education, where the emphasis is not on position or status, for example, but on effort and achievement. This kind of justice celebrates and rewards those who do well, work hard, and have special talent and abilities that they use to make a significant contribution to society. In other words, gifted people are recognized and encouraged to maximize those gifts for the better, betterment of society as a whole. Nevertheless, even a cursory reflection on this type of justice reveals that it can be badly misguided to use this kind of justice when considering the disenfranchised and those who have been hindered in the past by various factors. As well, when talking about being fair in some cases like organ transplant, a merit-based justice would wind up giving all the best to those who were better by the criteria that the society deemed to be better. It is probably better to use a different form of justice to ensure that abuses would not so readily arise in this kind of system. In addition, using such a system across the board will not take into account the special needs of some people, like the handicapped of the world, for example, who are, who are human and deserve to be treated with dignity, but who also lack the, quote, normal endowments of ability to succeed in society without any kind of structural help and aid. So such a system is important and useful for some arenas of society, but it cannot account for all forms of applied justice that are needed in just societies. For that, we need other forms of justice, one of which is egalitarian justice, to which we will now turn. So we now talk about egalitarian justice, which is found in um, verses such as Leviticus 19, 15. So the first type of egalitarian justice we can talk about is equal outcomes. 
In this form of justice, equality tends to demand that society should be a community of equals where some people are not privileged in such a way as to rule over, have greater good and greater access to the social benefit of that given society. This is essentially espoused in socialistic forms of government where everyone is not only seen as having equal dignity and worth, but everyone is forced to have equal outcomes in life, elevating the lowly, but also bringing low the mighty. History shows us, of course, that as often as it has been tried, this form of justice has never been able to be applied effectively anywhere. A far more popular form of egalitarian justice is what might be called the justice of equal access or equal opportunity. This is the attempt to give equal opportunity to all, even if all will not end up in the same place at the end of the day because of varying levels of skill, capacity, interest, etc. But it does require more impersonal and institutional measures to avoid nepotism, cronyism, and other such iniquities as these. Well, inequities and other such inequalities as these. There must be some sort of veil of ignorance in place to avoid these kinds of practices from creating unnecessary and unjust inequalities. The basic underlying goal here is that similar people in similar situations will receive similar treatment and have similar opportunities. Added to this, is another principle that might be deemed maximizing the minimum where those who for various reasons are starting at a lower level of opportunity are given special incentives and special opportunities to help level the field of play for all members of society. In the United States, this has resulted in something called affirmative action, where certain races and people from certain segments of society are given special scholarships and aids to enable them to be lifted out of their unequal situations of extreme ignorance and poverty. The challenges of this view are determining the proper means to level the playing field and to actually determine what equal access without equal results might actually look like and be retained if it ever could actually be achieved in the realities of our world as we know it today. For example, values in the contemporary world are not at all neutral to begin with. Some societies will value things in a way that will or will not render them competitive in an increasingly global and global market. How are we to deal with that? What does equality look like in those situations where markets demand assent to a certain set of values that may or may not be inherently good or just. Values like efficiency, cleanliness, timeliness, and initiative, educational excellence, and technical savvy, for example, may be extremely helpful in our globally connected world of today and tomorrow, but they may also render someone rude, unsociable, impatient, and odd in certain kinds of society. We might continue this critique, but let's stop here 
and move on to a third form of justice, namely need justice. Need justice can be found in the Bible in places such as Leviticus chapter 25 and, <clears throat> and Luke chapter 1 verses 52 and 53. This justice is connected to the basic need that people have in society. It seeks to recognize and meet those needs according to a fair and compassionate means of distribution. This view is especially sensitive to the fact that merit tends to be based not only on effort, but on a myriad of other factors like status, wealth, power, etc., that make it unfair for others to have access to certain goods and means in society. Thus, there needs to be a deliberate and thoughtful redistribution of certain things in society so that the disenfranchised and downtrodden of society will be given the opportunities that they deserve to have. In short, society needs partially to achieve impartiality, so to speak. <laughs> this creates problems for this view, of course, because how does one fairly determine who received this kind of aid or how and how much of this kind of aid and for how long. In addition, some people are needy because they are lazy and selfish, not because they are oppressed and downtrodden. There is also a tendency in this view toward what might be called sentimentality, where a concern for meeting people's immediate needs overshadows and even sometimes obscures the concern for dealing with the root problems that have led to the people being needy and oppressed in the first place. For example, giving to a beggar on the street may appear at first glance to be the most kind and compassionate thing to do. But in the long run, this kind of practice may in fact contribute to the enablement of his or her bad and irresponsible behavior. Here are some Christian reflections on the concrete application of justice. First, all three types of justice are found in scripture. Second, the three definitions seem to refer to the effective application of justice in different contexts and different situations. Number three, as such, all three definitions are important aspects of justice and therefore need to be held together in tension. So let's now talk about justice and responsibility. Who is responsible for carrying out justice? The church, the state, citizens, or Christians? That is to say, should justice be more institutionally enforced or be primarily the responsibility of individuals? Of course, this is a trick question, or what might be deemed a false dichotomy. The real answer is all of the above. But a deeper question is who or what is responsible for what in which situation, and who or what is the best person or entity for administering justice properly. Retributive, so let's, let me mention a few things to consider. 
Retributive justice is primarily, if not solely, the responsibility of the state. So retributive justice is where crimes are punished. And so retributive justice is primarily, if not solely, the responsibility of the state. And this is addressed in Romans chapter 13. Christians are responsible to promote justice in all the areas of life in which God places them. So whether you're in um, medicine, education, business, law, the ministry, or whatever area of life you are in. As Christians, we are responsible to promote justice wherever God places us. Now, Christians must be cautious about granting too much power to and placing too high of an expectation upon the state to administer justice. The reason for this is that the state must always be relativized by the presence of the church as a reflection of the supremacy, lordship, and ultimacy of Jesus Christ. Too much power given to the state ends up corrupting it and giving it ethical myopia. The state must always have the prophetic voice and active participation of the church to confront and encourage it to do and promote what is right and just. Here is a both and view of justice in the state and the church. And this quote comes from Dennis P. Hollinger. While individuals and churches must play a role in distributive justice, and while Christians must be cautious regarding an all-encompassing state, the state has a significant role to play in affecting a just society. To make justice the domain of government alone is to negate personal responsibility and to expect too much of this necessary but fallen institution. So here we see that Dennis P. Hollinger is saying that we need both justice through individual effort and justice through the state. So we've talked about two different kinds of justice, retributive justice and distributive justice. And this, in this lecture, we focused on distributive justice and we've explored some of the different issues that are involved with distributive justice. The next lecture is on pluralism and Christian ethics. So please go to the next lecture and we will talk about how we should live as Christians in a, an, in a pluralistic world.